I should have bore Jim Dunn's elephant because even within our little group, I will now present three projects where you could clearly see we did not communicate with ourselves. And we have these different parts of the elephant. Um, and it's all about drugs and one of the projects is using the literature and the two other projects are using the structured product labels. So uh, I have to tell you that whatever I say is not uh, the opinion of the U.S. government, it's my opinion and I don't have any financial interests. So, of course, uh, drug information for this community uh, is not a new topic. Uh, we have all looked at extracting all kinds of information about drugs from all kinds of different texts, particularly from clinical texts, and uh, these are by no means the, the three uh, data sets uh, at the beginning of the list are not exhaustive. It's just the reminders of how long and uh, what aspects of drug information we've been looking at. Um, and the three bullets at the bottom is the data sets that I'm going to describe today, um, all of which came about uh, because we talked to either our end users or our collaborators at um, the Food and Drug Administration, FDA. So, um, the medication extraction from the literature full information came about when we were evaluating uh, the use of medical subject headings that are added to our index section by um, um, to, to the PubMed abstracts. And the uh, end users are often pharmaceutical companies that need to know if some adverse reactions have been reported in the literature. And they have about 18,000 filters on uh, PubMed um, that are monitoring um, the publications for these adverse reactions. And what they told us that even if they get the signal that something was reported, uh, they still don't know what doses of the drug to cause that, and they need to go into the literature. And they told us absolutely into the full text because this information is not available in the abstracts. And um, they have to then read the paper to find that information. And wouldn't it be nice if some tool extracted it for them? And the other two, I uh, will talk a little more about FDA needs when I come to these challenges that we ran with NIST. So, um, drug dose information, which is everything, the drug name and form, the specific dose, and we also tried to uh, distinguish the dose and the strength, and I will tell you it was not a good idea. The route for, gi uh, for giving the drug, the frequency, the duration, and the reason. And those of you who did the I2B2 2009 challenge or used the data set are very familiar with this because that was the task. And you can see here the little interface we developed for ourselves back then because the participants were actually required to produce the um, gold standard. We were required to annotate our share of uh, clinical notes. So when we started looking uh, and the drug information in the literature, it turned out no one has ever extracted those information before. Um, so, and it is needed. So, uh, we asked ourselves these questions. Can we use these uh, multiple tools that achieved state of the art, the, the best tools that we reported recently for extracting um, those information on the I2B2 collection were in the high 90s of scores. So could we use those on the literature or do we need to develop a different collection uh, to achieve that level of uh, performance? Is it really that the full information is only available in the full text? And uh, what side of, of the collection? We had a sort of a premonition that the clinical text is very different from the literature and we will not achieve the same results. So if we do not achieve the results, what size of the collection do we need for 
um, the required nowadays deep learning. So um, the interesting part was how do we create that collection? How do we know where the doses are? Well, the first hint is that um, it has to talk, the article has to be annotated for pharmacological action. And because our vendors are interested in the adverse reactions, we did that search. Pharmacological action that leads to some adverse reactions, and hopefully these papers will report the drug doses. So we started with a year of uh, articles indexed in Medline. And after applying that filter, we still had 22,000. Then we know that supposedly the information is only in the full text. So we filtered by the availability of these articles in PubMed Central, which reduced the set to about 4,000 articles, uh, which was still too much, of course, to annotate manually. Uh, so we took the one of the best available clinical text tools, Medex, and applied it to those articles. And we also developed a regular expression that we hoped will be um, very recall oriented. We have a list of all kinds of drug um, units and anything the unit for the drug with a number before or after it, uh, we um, said that will be potentially a sentence that contains drug dose information. We then later applied a filter that said, oh, and by the way, a drug name has to be in the sentence as well. But that filter was then precision oriented for that subset. So um, then we randomly, not, not quite randomly, sort of stratified <coughs> randomly. And I will show you how we selected uh, these sentences for manual annotations a little later. So on these sentences, we could evaluate the precision of our tools but we could not uh, evaluate recall. So for that purpose, we then took 70 um, PubMed abstracts and annotated them fully. Uh, we used the same strategy that we applied to the 2016. We applied it to the 2017 data, and then we manually annotated 70 abstracts completely. So that's the collection. We used bread for our annotations, and this is the information that we wanted to annotate. And in this example, of course, you see that the dose and the strengths are very easy to distinguish. That was really not the case. Um, that was the source of most of the disagreements between the annotators to the point where I said, forget about it, just put one or the other because most likely we are going to merge it you know, the, which one you feel is better. But there is really, uh, in real life, very hard to distinguish which one is the dose and which one is the strength. Um, that uh, paper was presented at AMI last year, and I did not have the picture of uh, the, the required picture of the deep learning, and of course the reviewers came back and said you have to have a picture and um, show you character embeddings and whatnot. So here you are, the picture is here. But it's really out of the box uh, tool that uh, we did not do any adjustments. It's a character uh, level embeddings, then pre-trained glove embeddings, and then a CRF layer trained for BIO. And what's interesting, you will see the results. It depends actually how you train BIO or IO, you get somewhat different results for uh, the out-of-the-box performance. So then we evaluated Maddox and our regular expression uh, for sentence level correctness. And we were very kind to, uh, to these two tools. We said, as long as they found some drug name and said, this is the drug that is reported in this sentence, we assume the dose was there too. And um, for the uh, deep learning, we actually wanted it to be really accurate. So we uh, evaluated at each entity. So uh, the F scores are in hand to find exactly the whole sequence, the way we annotated it. Um, this is how we selected the sentences. So we wanted to see if 
uh, each method contributes something specifically. So uh, for each of the methods, we took the sentences that were uh, found only by this specific approach. And of course, there were some overlap. And um, as I mentioned before, we also filtered the uh, regular expression pattern by the presence of the medication in the sentence. And as expected, different methods have different performance on uh, different parts of the text. The, the full text, we also played with segmentation of the full text, mostly with uh, the doses will be reported in the method, methods section. So that's why we have the methods section on its own, which actually did not work out. Um, it, we can see that when you take the full text, you get a better recall. Um, and um, we also see that when the methods agree, uh, the sentence actually is mo more likely to contain those information. So, as I said, we were very kind to the uh, non-deep learning baselines, and we still observe a significant drop in, in performance for MEDEX. Um, for the deep learning baseline, out of the box, without actually knowing what we're doing, the results are very bad. Now, if we pre-train for I.O. without uh, B, then the results are really good, you can see on the bottom. This is the default, but then we could not actually approve or, uh, improve over that um, default performance for I.O. with the tricks that we use to improve the performance for B.I.O. The, um, the, the things that worked were um, conflating the dose and the strength, because it was very confusing, and masking the, medica the real medication names with the word uh, basically indicating that the axes here are some entity that we care about and by that forcing uh, the model to learn actually the pattern of the drug dose around the medication name. So um, on the 70 abstracts we could see all kinds of errors um, and it turns out that the difference between the clinical text in the and the literature is that no one will use the drugs in the clinical text for any other purposes than treating the patient, whereas in the literature it could be the medium for uh, the cells. Um, it could be the percentages of the patients enrolled uh, in some trial on that specific drug. And we also discovered some forms of the drugs that we haven't seen before. These are these new targeted delivery drugs that we didn't even think about when we were creating our patterns. So um, the collection is uh, somewhat limited. It's broad, but it's very shallow because we extracted these sentences. We didn't look at the full text. Uh, what we discovered, it's actually harder to annotate these sentences without the context. Uh, it's actually, when we were annotating the abstracts for the test set after annotating the sentences, it was a pleasure because we could understand what they're talking about from the context of the abstract. We had, so the Maddox tool does not accept UTF, uh, so we had to convert um, the text to the ASCII characters, and we got some um, bugs in the conversion, so you can see question marks instead of the um, uh, UTF characters in our doses. And uh, I already said the doses and these things are very hard to distinguish, and these good results on the uh, baseline did require manual annotation of about you know, um, 600 or so articles. So uh, we have this collection. We were happy to get some requests for um, explanations. So we know several groups are actually using this collection already. The tools and the collection, everything is available online, the pre-trained model. Um, we, we've seen the traditional about 20% drop in performance for the uh, tool trained on the clinical text. 
Uh, those information is mostly reported in the full text, but we were very surprised that 45% of these articles actually had information in the abstracts and even in the titles. And, um, yeah, the uh, baseline um, is provided, so I hopefully, hopefully people will uh, beat the baseline by far. So uh, I'm switching now to these FDA tasks that came about because of uh, our interagency agreement with FDA. We are uh, several groups at FDA um, approached us independently. And uh, for the first task, for the adverse drug reactions, uh, there are several groups at FDA that are also sort of uh, going back to that elephant. They have some different goals for extracting these adverse drug reactions. So when we met with the representatives of, like, I think two of the three or four or five groups that are interested in extraction of adverse drug reactions, uh, we decided to follow the letter uh, of the uh, regulations that they give to the industry and the way they define the adverse drug reactions. Um, but we also then um, observed that uh, the goal for one of these groups was to see if that reaction was previously observed for that specific drug in people. And um, there is a database where people uh, are reporting, the, the clinicians and uh, the public that is taking the drugs are reporting their reactions to FDA. And what happens, FDA has to go back to the drug label and see if that reaction was reported before. And if it wasn't reported, then it's a new reaction and it needs to be added to the label when it's edited. So um, right now they do not have, they still, I believe, do not have a database where all the labeled reactions are presented in some structured form so that they can actually just look it up in the database. They literally have to go back to the label. Um, and it's very time consuming and it's all done manually. So the goal was to create a test collection to see if the tools that are offered uh, to FDA can actually extract these asserted drug reactions in people. Um, so that's the um, we, we kind of worked backwards with that one. When we created the collection, we told our collaborators at FDA, here, here's the collection, and they said, what do we do with it? And we said, well, you know, you could run a, a shared task and see how people f perform on it. And they, of course, do not have experience with shared tasks, so, uh, but they actually were uh, very happy to know that the National Institute of Standards is uh, running these evaluations uh, within the text analytics conference. So we approached NIST and asked them if they would uh, host that task, and they did. So in 2017, we had this task where really you have to get these asserted drug reactions and map them to the controlled vocabulary that is used to report these reactions, which is MEDRA. So after that task was done, uh, those of you who participated in NIST evaluations know that NIST really likes to have the second year because the first year usually has just all kinds of bugs and kinks to work out and the second year you can really start observing what, how the tools perform and start to compare the approaches. Um, so we sort of said, well, we don't really have any other adverse drug reaction collections, but how about a somewhat similar uh, task, drug-drug interaction <coughs> extraction? And they said, well, okay, that will do. So uh, last year we ran the drug-drug interactions, and I will show you uh, the collection for that. And, and the goal here is for the drug-drug interaction extraction is to produce what FDA is calling an index file. So for every drug label, there has to be that index file that the machine can understand for various purposes. And in that file, it will be the label drug is always the label drug. 
and then the other drugs that are interacting with the label drug and what kind of interaction is that and as opposed to the um, adverse drug reactions that is mapped to only one controlled vocabulary in that index file the uh, different parts of that index file have to be mapped to different vocabularies it's a um, either um, NCI for uh, the reaction types um, for the specific interactions it's SNOMED and uh, they're switching from the national drug file to some other name reference terminology for drug names. So um, the motivation for these talks was it's practical, um, we are supporting FDA, it's interesting, it's challenging NLP problems and should we succeed, it will actually have a real impact. And I just described the tasks in gory details, so I'll move on. Um, so the um, translated to the NLP tasks, what are we asking the participants to do? Well, first find the mentions, then find the relations, then at the document level, for uh, the t and, and the normalization tasks to the vocabularies, and then at the document level, uh, find the asserted positive reactions in people and map to Medra, and uh, produce the index file for FDA. Uh, we had uh, for the uh, 2017 task, we were hiding our. Uh, test collection in plain sight. So we gave people uh, 2,000 labels um, that included the test files in them. They just didn't know which ones were the test files. And we, um, there was really just a counting mistake on our part, so it turned out that we produced 101 training file and 99 test files. Um, which is, I guess, fine. <laughs> um, so, as I mentioned previously, the reactions could be caused by the drug or hypothetical, you know, it could be reported that it might or might not produce that reaction. So, or they could be observed only in animals. So we annotated all these parts and then um, these were the mentions that people had to extract. But for the final result, they only had to report the ones that were observed for the specific drug in people and no hedging, like really observed. Uh, for the drug-drug interactions collection, we did not have time to prepare um, too many training files in the required format. We had a previous effort several years ago where we annotated uh, some files in a similar format and so these were available for training. We also produced 22 training files in the required format and then we um, found out that Rick Boyce from uh, University of Pittsburgh actually is also working on a drug-drug interaction annotation in a somewhat different format, he did not annotate pharmacodynamic interactions, they only annotated pharmacokinetic, and they only annotated those on the drug interaction sections of the label and on the clinical pharmacology sections. But they were kind enough to add the pharmacodynamic to their sections, so we had these test sets uh, in two parts, 57 annotated by FDA and NLM, on this full set of sections that you see that are of interest to FDA, and then 66 from University of Pittsburgh that uh, only had um, two sections annotated. We gave the uh, section tests um, and the sort of the template files to the participants so that at least on the offsets, hopefully there will be no confusion because the text was right there for them and uh, they didn't have spent their time on converting the um, structured product labels that are not really very structured to XML. So uh, we had a decent number of participants. Uh, we are pleased that it was international and from academia and uh, industry. Um, and in 2017, 
most people attempted most uh, all of the tasks. Um, whereas in 2018, uh, although we had a good number of participants and even the two returning teams, only one team attempted all tasks. Uh, so it kind of tells you that it's really a hard task. The approaches were about the same, um, although we did not see any... Uh, we, we saw a greater um, percentage of uh, deep learning approaches in 2018. Uh, and the results for the mentions are very different, just showing you that at least in that task, as a community, we know more or less how to extract problems, but when it even comes then to drugs, we're not that great still. Uh, so for the drug names and for the types of the reactions and the indicators of the reactions, uh, the results are basically half of what we achieved on the adverse drug reactions. And then the relations uh, are also much harder to, for drug-drug interactions compared to the relations uh, in the adverse drug reactions. What's really interesting, the relations on ADRs are not so great either, but they did not matter that much for the final task because there are very few relations in terms of that was observed in animals, that was observed for the drug class. Whereas for the drug-drug interactions, the relations are what we're looking for. So you can see that for the FDA output, uh, the results were pretty good for ADRs because the relations did not matter all that much. But for um, the final task, where, and it's a really complex task, you have to extract these complex relations and then map them to these four different vocabularies. And this is what is the, the final output is evaluated on. You can see that the results are not great, um, and the results on the test set for which we did not have training data is worse for, than the results for the other sections. And of course, the normalization is somewhere in between. It's really good normalization to NEDRA, and the normalization to these. Uh, for dictionaries is not so great either. So um, the ADR extraction uh, and mapping to a simple vocabulary, although it's not a completely resolved task, but I think uh, FDA can run with the existing tools. Um, but for the drug drug uh, interactions, there is still a lot of work to do. And uh, we will continue the track this year, hopefully with uh, better results. That's it. Uh, all the collections are, of course, available. And I'll be happy to answer your questions.